Back when I first tested the Skylake based Core i7 6700K a few weeks prior to its release, I ended up publishing results that were on par with the 4790K and at times the 6700K was even slower. There are a few reasons for why I found these results. Unaware at the time, my ASRock Z97 motherboard was being overly aggressive with a maximum turbo frequency, or at least how many cores would reach said frequency on the 4790K. In other words, it wasn't adhering to the Intel spec. The other, and let's say primary reason, was down to the fact that the 6700K really isn't any faster than the 4790K for the most part. IPC performance has only been improved by up to 10%. Leading tech site Nantech also found in a clock for clock gaming comparison, Skylake was no faster than Haswell and in many instances was even slower, which was an odd discovery. In the end, I concluded that Intel's most powerful and efficient architecture yet, Skylake, was for the most part a disappointment. Obviously at the time, this wasn't even taking into account the fact that six months later, the 6700K would still retail for around 20% more than the 4790K. The continued incremental baby steps Intel has been taking for years now made me question if there was any real need for Sandy Bridge Core i5 2500K and Core i7 2600K owners to upgrade, especially if they were predominantly gaming. Due to my early adopter syndrome, my 2600K system was retired in favour of the 3770K, which was of course retired for the 4770K and so on. However, after looking at a number of gaming performance articles recently focusing on games such as Rise of the Tomb Raider and Tom Clancy's The Division for example, I noticed the 2600K and 6700K weren't that far apart, especially considering these articles weren't overclocking the CPUs, putting the 2600K at a 15% clock disadvantage. Interested to know how not only the Core i7-6700K compares to the 5 year old 2600K, but also the 3770K, 4770K and even 5775C in a clock for clock comparison, I resurrected my old gaming rigs. The objective is simple, to compare 5 generations of Core i7 processors using the closest possible specifications. This meant clocking and locking them all at 4GHz with any frequency boosting technologies disabled, along with speed step. The processors using DDR3 memory targeted 2400MHz, and the 2600K was the only DDR3 processor to drop down to 2133 MHz, as the memory controller isn't stable at 2400 MHz. Meanwhile, the DDR4 memory used by the 6700K was clocked at 2666 MHz, which we've found previously to be about the sweet spot. Initially, I had planned to only test them using a flagship graphics card such as the GeForce GTX 980 Ti, and having done so, it became clear that in conjunction with the lesser card, such as the GTX 970, we could paint a more complete picture. So it was settled. The 5 Core i7 processors clocked at 4GHz would be tested in 9 cutting edge games at 1080p using the GTX 980 Ti and GTX 970. Along with the game data, I've also included power consumption figures and raw memory bandwidth data. That being said, let's move on to the benchmarks. The memory bandwidth figures between the processor and the DDR memory range from 30GB per second to a little over 35GB per second with the DDR4 2666 enabled Skylake processor providing the best result. That said, the Broadwell and Haswell processors weren't far behind using DDR3 2400 memory. It is interesting to note that the L3 cache, yes, cache since it's not a currency, is considerably higher on the Skylake processor, whereas the previous four generations all delivered similar performance. Using a GTX 980 Ti graphics card, we find there's virtually no difference between the Core i7 2600K and the most recent 6700K model. The Skylake processor was just 4% faster when comparing the average frame rate and 2% faster for the minimum frame rate. Swapping out the 980 Ti for the more popular GTX 970 reduced the margin to just a single percent when comparing the average frame rate. Battlefield 4's single player campaign isn't particularly taxing on the CPU, so it'll be interesting to see the correlation between the GTX 980 Ti and GTX 970 on these processors in more demanding titles. Here we find some interesting results when using Black Ops 3. The Haswell, Broadwell and Skylake processors all delivered similar results. However, when we move from Haswell to Ivy Bridge, we see a 9% reduction in frame rate, followed by a further 5% reduction when moving from Ivy Bridge to Sandy Bridge. 
This means overall the 2600K was 15% slower than the 6700K when comparing minimum frame rate, though it was just 5% slower if we look at the average frame rate. Now, this is very interesting. Reducing the available GPU power with the GTX 970 eliminates any difference between the 2600K and 6700K completely. This still very powerful graphics card doesn't have enough rendering power to separate these processes in Black Ops 3. Fallout 4 might not be the best example given the game's strange tendencies with memory bandwidth in certain areas of the game. Whereas the 2600K through to the 5775C all deliver similar performance, the 6700K is 11% faster than the Broadwell and Haswell processors, while beating the Sandy Bridge 2600K by a 17% margin. This just shows what a strange animal Fallout 4 is. Here we see that despite using a much slower graphics card, we receive very much the same performance. This clearly indicates a serious CPU bottleneck in this game, which is shocking given the average frame rate for most of these processors is below 60 FPS. GTA 5 is probably the best game we could use for such a test, so these results are worth paying attention to. Like Black Ops 3 with the 980 Ti, we find the Haswell, Broadwell and Skylake processors all deliver similar performance with just a few frames per second separating them. However, if we look at the Ivy Bridge 3770K, we see a noticeable decline in performance and then again when moving to the 2600K. The average frame rate of the 2600K was 16% slower than the 6700K, while the minimum frame rate was 22% lower. That said, it is important to note that the 2600K did manage a minimum frame rate of no less than 90 FPS, so still obviously very playable. This is again where things get very interesting. Armed with a still very capable GTX 970, a $300 graphics card, we see very little difference between these processors. The 6700K is now just 5 FPS or 6% faster than the 2600K and just 3% faster than the 3770K. For a single player game, Just Cause 3 is very CPU intensive and we see a bit of that in these results. Even so, the 6700K doesn't exactly crush the 2600K as it only provided a 6% greater average frame rate coupled with an 8% better minimum frame rate. Those are some pretty insignificant results with the GTX 980 Ti handling the rendering work at 1080p. As we've seen numerous times already, using a more commonly featured GPU in gaming systems, the difference between these various processors becomes even smaller. The 6700K is now just 5% faster than the 2600K when comparing the minimum frame rate and even less when looking at the average. The popular tactical shooter Rainbow Six Siege plays the same regardless of whether you're running a Core i7 2600K or a 6700K. The 6700K was less than 2% faster when comparing the minimum frame rate, so nothing more needs to be said here. Given what we saw when testing Rainbow Six Siege with the 980 Ti, we didn't expect to see anything different with the GTX 970, and as expected, we didn't. As is the case with all multiplayer games, it is impossible to accurately test this portion of the game, forcing us to benchmark a single player training mission. As you can see with the GTX 980 Ti crushing pixels, there's virtually no difference between the 2600K and the 6700K. The margins are reduced further with the GTX 970, and here the 6700K was just 5% faster than the 2600K when comparing minimum frame rates. Rise of the Tomb Raider is a visually stunning game that's also fairly CPU intensive. That said, when armed with the GTX 980 Ti, all five processors are able to deliver similar performance in 1080p. The 6700K was just 5% faster than the 2600K when comparing minimum frame rate. Now with the 970, the 6700K is just a single frame faster than 2600K, while the average frame rate is identical across the board. The Witcher 3 results are surprising given we expected to see similar average frame rate results with a rather large variation in the minimum frame rates. It appears the opposite is true. Here the 2600K never dipped below 55 FPS, making the 6700K just 7% faster. However, if we look at the average frame rate, the 6700K was 13% faster. Again, not a huge difference, but more than we were expecting given the minimums. Finally, as we've discovered time and time again, when swapping out the 980 Ti for the 970, we see any previous margins dissolved into almost nothing. In fact, this time it was absolutely nothing, as the 2600K and 6700K deliver the same minimum frame rate result. This is really where Intel has made the greatest strides over the past few years, efficiency. Despite being faster than Sandy Bridge and CPU bound games, the Skylake architecture is seen to consume 14% less power in Just Cause 3. Granted, going from a total system consumption of 335 watts down to 287 watts isn't game changing. This improvement still comes while achieving greater performance. Testing with Rise of the Tomb Raider, we see similar power consumption figures. Here the 6700K consumes slightly less power than both the 5775C 
and 4770K. Okay, so let's get right down to making sense of all that data with a few fun line graphs. What you're looking at here is the averages for those minimum frame rates across all nine games tested. The light blue bar represents the GTX 980 Ti data, with the darker blue bar the GTX 970, while the corresponding processors can be seen below. Here we see there's just a 2% performance difference between the 2600K and 6700K using the 970. That margin is increased to 9% in favour of the 6700K once we increase the rendering power with the 980 Ti. Honestly, these margins aren't significant at all. However, you might be sitting there saying, come on Matt, stop shaping the results with those non-CPU intensive games. Well, I hear you, so here's a 5 game average using The Witcher 3, Black Ops 3, Fallout 4, Just Cause 3 and GTA 5. What's interesting to note here is that again with the GTX 970, the 6700K is only marginally faster than the 2600K, just 3% faster in fact. The 980 Ti on the other hand does allow the 6700K as well as the 5775C and 4770K to stretch their legs a bit. As a result, the 6700K was 17% faster than the 2600K with an 81 FPS average minimum opposed to 69 FPS for the 2600K. Now there are a few things to consider here. If we were to test all five processors clocked at 4.5 GHz for example, the GTX 980 Ti margins would likely become closer, if only slightly. Likewise, if we downclock the processors to 3.5 GHz, the margins might grow slightly too. Naturally, the margins would also grow when using the more powerful GPU configurations, particularly if SLI or Crossfire is employed, for example. Still, considering all these factors, I believe it's fair to say that owners of an unclocked Sandy Bridge processor really have no immediate need to upgrade. This is particularly true when spending $300 or less on a graphics card. If you invested around $300 in a Cry 7 2600K five years ago, you're probably pretty happy with the run it's had, especially if you're the kind of gamer that springs for a mid-range GPU once every year or two. Be sure to let me know what you think about the results. Are you surprised by how well the Sandy Bridge 2600K handles the GeForce GTX 970? I know I was having initially tested with the GTX 980 Ti. Don't forget to hit like and hit subscribe on your way out and I'll see you guys again next time. Yeah.